I can't believe it, but we've made it to the end. So um, we are at the end of lower GI. And when I say the end, like, I mean, I still have my biliary lectures to get to y'all and my urinary tract lectures, but they'll be here soon. Um, so appendicitis, um, this is the last lower GI topic. So appendicitis is an inflammation of the appendix, You've got that itis in it. Um, and most commonly happens to people that are aged uh, between age 10 and 30. Um, it happens, you know, the appendix used to maybe be an organ that we really needed or served a purpose, but, um, you know, now um, it's not really necessarily something that uh, there's not like a function that the appendix does for us. So, um, you know, I always find it funny you know, to learn. I, I found it funny to learn when I learned more about appendicitis that, you know, when, um, you know, most people like at least, you know, my age people um, and that I'm in my thirties, by the way. So uh, most people that are in their thirties, their parents, um, when they were growing up, like you came in with abdominal pain. One of the first things I do is just took out your appendix because they're like, Hey, you don't need it now. Like they do more testing now. Cause there's obviously more things that can be going on, but it's kind of funny how it used to just be like, Hey, let's just take that thing out. Now I'll tell you most of the fix for appendicitis these days is to take it out. But usually we do further testing first. Um, so why would your appendix get inflamed? So you have this like little organ hanging off. Um, it, it's in your right lower quadrant. Um, why is it getting inflamed in the first place if it doesn't even have a job? Well, because of where it's located, it can actually accumulate stool and then this can lead it to get irritated, inflamed, um, and eventually it can burst. You can get that peritonitis. So um, I would expect a patient to have um, pain and specifically pain, what's called McBurney's point. So if you look here where the appendix is, McBurney's point, you know, here, oh, come on, Jesus. Sorry. Oh, no, get back here. Sorry, my mouse is dying on me. So yes, so um, the appendix is here, the belly button's here. McBurney's point is in like in the middle. So like, you know, um, I'm, I'm assuming you can see my mouse moving here. Hopefully you can. Um, but if you go to the belly button and go, down into the, like, I mean, I guess if you're looking at it, it's the left, but if, if you're looking at yourself, find your belly button, go down into the right, that is where McBurney's point is. It's not actually over the appendix, it's in between the belly button and the appendix. Um, the patient can also very commonly have nausea, vomiting with this, a low grade fever. They're going to complain of pain um, that gets worse with pressure, like coughing, sneezing, deep inhalation. They're going to feel better when they're lying still or when they're bending their right leg. Um, and it again, just creates that fetal position. Um, I want to um, do a very thorough pain assessment on them. I need to note the location, what makes it better or worse. I'm going to assess for other GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting, assess for signs of an um, infection like fever, and then um, be looking for signs of complications. Now, your textbook says that it's expected pretty much for them to have rebound tenderness and rigidity, um, and, it, and they can, especially in that right lower quadrant, but I am going to be very concerned about rupture, um, so I um, definitely want to keep a close eye. So for me personally, um, you know, if someone, if I had a patient that started having really bad rebound tenderness or rigidity in that area, I would be um, concerned about, you know, that they have perforated. Um, uh, something else that was interesting um, that I recently learned is, is that um, patients that have appendicitis, when they finally um, do perforate rough rupture, if not, I'm not saying that happens to every single patient because sometimes we take it out in time. Um, but if for someone who finally does get perforation, um, the strange thing is, is, is that they actually, their pain can get better. So if you had a patient who's like, oh, oh, my pain is suddenly better. Um, that's actually sometimes a sign that they have perforated because they'll say like, oh, I feel so much better, but then they're going to suddenly start getting really sick because then we start getting into that peritonitis territory. So while it seems like, and I have on the next slide, hey, they're, if their pain is getting better, um, you know, keep in mind the caveat there is if their pain is suddenly better, it can also be a sign that they perforated. Um, labs or diagnostics that we're going to do are a white blood cell count, a CT of the abdomen, uh, maybe an ultrasound to look at things. I'm pretty much just looking for infection and problems in that area. So like I mentioned, normally for the most part, if they have less pain, and I'm more so talking about, um, you know, like most of the time appendicitis doesn't resolve itself. They have appendicitis, we take their appendix out. Like we don't mess around and say like, well, let's wait and see if it ruptures. Um, we usually just take it out. If it's inflamed, irritated, we're not going to, it's like a ticking time bomb. We're just going to take it out. So if I thought, well, I'm taking care of a patient, all of a sudden they start feeling better. Um, it is going to be concerning, but after their surgery, 
hopefully the goal would be that they're getting better. They have less pain um, and other symptoms. Um, but yeah. Uh, and then if they have uh, decreased or um, no fever, because we want less signs of infection, no signs of a complication. Um, if they're getting more pain or worsening symptoms again, or there's that caveat that if their pain suddenly goes away, it could be a sign of perforation. If they have an increased or worsened fever or signs of infection, um, those signs of perforation and peritonitis, like the rebound tenderness, rigidity, or guarding. Um, and then we also want to think about systemic signs of infection or shock, like a low blood pressure, high heart rate. Um, and then um, the double Ds again, signs of dehydration or uh, dysrhythmias. Um, overall, the way we treat it, um, we usually do surgery. Um, if it's ruptured, they may need IV fluids and antibiotics. And then we just manage their symptoms, pain management and antiemetics. Um, as the nurse, I'm going to ensure the patient stays hydrated, monitoring their eyes and O's closely. Um, a big key thing for me as the nurse to do is to keep the patient MPO. I don't want anything that's going to stimulate the bowels above or below. Um, so pretty much I don't want anything that's going to um, create contractions in the bowels because it can lead to that perforation. So the patient shouldn't be eating anything and I shouldn't be like giving them any sort of laxative suppository bowel stimulant in that way, um, up the butt or in their mouth. Um, what do you call it? And I don't mean, you know, well, you, you get the point. I'm not going to try to explain that, but you get it. Just nothing by mouth and then also nothing up the butt. Um, and then after they have their surgery, they're usually discharged within 24 hours. If it's perforated, they may need to stay longer in the hospital. Um, I wanna encourage early ambulation after their um, surgery, cause it's going to help. We wanna get them farting. We love when patients fart after GI surgeries. Um, and then we usually want to um, tell, we usually will tell them you can resume normal activity two to three weeks after their surgery. All right, so the next thing I would recommend, um, at this point that we finish the disorders is that it's really time to make a table. I have a ton of tables on my Google drive. You can email me if you, um, uh, if you need access to that. Um, but um, pretty much now you want to differentiate, make tables, start really breaking down, okay, which of these patients is going to be NPO, NG tube, which of these patients have a special diet, which of these patients, um, uh, what do you call it, have some sort of special care, special teaching, uh, medications, but you really want to start breaking down. And when you're making tables like this, you're not trying to put every last detail in. You're just trying to put about what's different and really start to um, look at it in a different way. Like try to see the, be the best ways you can process it. The other thing that you could do is the speed dating thing that I talk about where you effectively get a bunch of blank pieces of paper. You write the name of each disorder or disease that you need to know um, for your exam on a piece of paper. Um, and then set a timer for one minute and for, um, without your notes, anything else, just your beautiful brain, you have one minute to write down everything you know about each topic. So you get like one minute with inflammatory bowel, one minute with appendicitis, one minute with hernia, one minute with ostomies, um, whatever it might be, um, take one minute and just try to get whatever information you can out. This shows, this is a great way to study right before an exam, because it helps you to see what you know and don't know, because there's the time pressure that you have one minute to get out what you know, which is kind of like the same on an exam. It'd be simulating the same if you were on an exam and it's like, oh God, I have one minute to answer this question. It could definitely help you to get that out. Um, but yeah, highly recommend doing something like that, like the speed dating. Then after, you, um, after you've written stuff down on each, go back and compare and contrast and maybe then take those um, disorganized notes, whatever your brain dump was, whatever came out of your head for each of those disease processes and um, try to make it into a concept map or try to teach it to someone else, get it out and see if you can explain it um, and maybe expand upon those notes that you have down. Um, but yeah, it's starting to look at how things are different and go from there. There's lots of diseases in this section, um, but it's just about kind of try to make sense of each one and um, bring it together. Anyway, that's it. I'll see you for the next one.